All right. So it is uh, two o'clock. And so we will get started with uh, today's lecture. Um, as always, feel free to uh, send me a message if you have any questions about anything while we go through this. So I'll get up my PowerPoint. There we go. All right. So on Wednesday, we were uh, beginning to talk about hydrogen bonds. Um, and we looked at polar groups and how water can hydrogen bond with itself. Now we're going to continue talking about that by talking about the hydrophobic effect. Um, and what happens during the hydrophobic effect is that if you add a nonpolar molecule to water, water can't hydrogen bond with a nonpolar molecule. And it's very energetically unfavorable to try in hydrogen bond, or it's very energetically unfavorable not to be able to hydrogen bond with something if you're water. And so water does not want to be around these hydrophobic molecules. So a common misconception about the hydrophobic effect is that the oil doesn't want to interact with the water. And that's not true. Uh, oil doesn't care. Oil would be happy to interact with the water and it would be happy to interact with itself. Um, it's the water that does not want to interact with the oil because it can't hydrogen bond. So what's gonna happen is that all this oil nonpolar molecules are gonna be pushed together and you're gonna form this cage around your uh, nonpolar molecules. And this is called a clathrin. So you're gonna form this cage-like uh, uh, cage of water around the nonpolar molecules. And what this is doing is that it is minimizing the amount of water molecules that have to interact with your nonpolar molecules. So although these water molecules are ordered, so you are creating order from disorder, which is not good. You are minimizing the amount of water that has to not hydrogen bond with the oil, which is good. So um, if you just look at these two examples, A, you drop the oil in, you have a lot of water having to not hydrogen bond with the oil. Water doesn't want to do that. So randomly, and this is all random, the water doesn't like, it, it, it's not coherent. It doesn't know it's doing this, but through random movements, what will happen is that all this oil will gather together, right? And then the water that's around that oil will be frozen in place, more or less. Um, and so you're minimizing the contact you have with that oil. That's why when you put oil in water, you see that layer forming after a couple of seconds. So that is the hydrophobic effect. There's no repulsion, um, oil doesn't care. It's just water trying to minimize the contact it has with nonpolar substances. So just so we're all on the same page about um, hydrophobic molecules, I have uh, five molecules here and I want you to rank them for, from most soluble to least soluble. And I will have a poll just to see where we're at. Um, and so the way this poll works is that for, for number one, what compound A, B, C, D, or E is the most soluble? Uh, two, which is the second most soluble, three, which is the third most soluble, four, fourth most soluble, and five, what's the least soluble? So um, make your selections, try to rank them, and then put them into into the poll so I can see um, where we are at understanding uh, polar molecules versus nonpolar molecules.
And so number one should be your most soluble, number five, your least soluble, and go from there. We'll do like maybe a minute-ish more on this. And so remember, things that are soluble in water will want will be able to hydrogen bond with water because that's what water wants to do if you can't hydrogen bond with water you're going to be kicked out of the water just like oil is right so it seems we have a, a good amount of people who have their orders um So don't know how to identify solubility from just a structure. So I just identified the FON. Is that the correct way of going about it? Um, that is a very good way of going about it. Um, that's basically how you do it. But there are some caveats, for example, when you look at A, um, A versus E. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. But if you just look at What's the number of fluorines, oxygens, and nitrogens? That's a decent way to go about it. All right, so let me end this poll. Let me share it with everybody. All right, so looks like, let me just check EAD. So it looks like um, collectively, we all have the right, we have the majority saying the right answers. So I'll just briefly uh, walk through this. Um, so the most soluble is C because it has three hydrogen bonding groups, uh, NH2, NH2, and this C double bond O can all be in hydrogen bonds and you have no really um, hydrophobic part of your molecule. So that molecule um, we will be able to mix with water like in equal proportions. It is like super soluble. The next most soluble is B, because the only difference between B and C, so C is number one, um, B is number two, is that you replace a, a nitrogen with a carbon. Again, CH3 can't hydrogen bond, so you're losing on one hydrogen bond group, but you still have two others. All right, uh, the next is E, so that's number three. That's because you have this C double bond O group. C double bond O is great for hydrogen bonding. Uh, four is A um, because you have this ether. So COC, um, that oxygen is not the most polar oxygen. So it's not great at hydrogen bonding. It can still do it marginally. But if you're comparing C double bond O versus COC, that is much better at hydrogen bonding because there's a lot more polarity happening than something like this, all right? So C double bond O is better, so that's why it's four. Uh, D, that's all hydrophobic. There are no hydrogen bonding groups there, so that is not soluble at all. All right, um, so that's how you can determine solubility by just looking at compounds. You are just basically looking at 
the amount of hydrogen bonding groups. And then there are some fringe cases where you have to actually think about polarity of the molecules. All right, so let's go to our last uh, topic for this PowerPoint, and then we'll move on to the next PowerPoint. And we're talking about water, but we have to talk about water in context of a cell, because this is biochemistry, right? It's just not straight up chemistry, where we do molecules for molecules sake. Um, so water is full of, um, oh, sorry, cells are full of water in dissolved substances proteins, uh, salts, um, sugars are all dissolved in your cells. And these dissolved substances will affect what are known as colligative properties. If you remember all the way back from the beginning of Gen Chem 2, back when you were young, you, we, we learned about colligative properties. And they're just properties that are affected by the amount of stuff that are dissolved in water, such as boiling point, freezing point, and osmotic pressure. Now cells, they have a certain concentration of salt that is dissolved in them. Um, and they also have this process of osmosis constantly going on. Osmosis is the movement of water from high to low concentration, spontaneous movement. And so when you're dealing with cells, for example, red blood cells, let's say you go to a hospital or you work at a hospital and you have a sample of red blood cells, you have to put them in a solution that is isotonic. An isotonic solution is a solution that has the same concentration of ions that are found inside the cell. Because when you're in an isotonic solution, water leaving the cell is the same rate as water going into the cell. While in a hypertonic solution, you have more salt on the outside of the cell in the solution than you do inside. So water leaves the cell much faster than it does going in, and you have a shrinking effect. Your water shrinks down. While a hypotonic solution is that you have more salt inside the cells than you do in the water, and so what happens is that water will go into the cell a lot more than it will leave in your water cells. Um, your rear red blood cells will burst, right? Um, and so one, one little story I like to tell about this is uh, back when the Nintendo Wii was popular, if you remember that like a decade ago now, um, there was a contest in California called Hold Your Wii for a Wii where contestants would drink a liter of water or some, some amount of water, and whoever peed last would win a Nintendo Wii. Um, unfortunately, somebody died doing this because that water that they drank made their blood slightly hypotonic. Their red blood cells started to swell with all that excess water that they didn't get out of their body naturally. Their red blood cells started to burst and then they, they died. So um, being in an isotonic solution is very, very important for all your cells, especially your red blood cells. It's important if you work in a hospital to make sure you get that solution right um, if you're storing any cells. All right, so just to make sure we understand this, um, I have a last question for you. So we have red blood cells. The red blood cells have an internal salt concentration of a 150 millimolar. I take this, uh, these cells and I put them in a beaker of 500 millimolar salt. So A says, if I'm permeable to water but not to ions, what happens in terms of osmosis? And B says, okay, let's flip it around. Now, if I can allow ions to move, what direction do my ions move in or outside the cell? And I should have um, a poll for that, just so we can get the answer. So what happens if water can move inside and outside the cell? What happens if it's only to ions? And so I will just draw a little picture. So 
on the top here. So I have my red blood cell inside 150, outside is 500. And we're gonna say that, we're just gonna say it's NaCl. It really doesn't matter what the salt is. Any salt would do this. So A, I can only move water. B, I can only move ions. Do about uh, 30 more seconds. All right, so let's take a look at this. So again, it looks like the majority of us got it right. So I'll, I'll just briefly explain what's going on here. So if water is allowed to move, the concentration of salt is much higher than the concentration, concentration of salt outside the cell. It's much higher than inside the cell. And so what's gonna happen is that water will leave the cell. So water heads towards the, the direction of higher salt concentration. Uh, naturally. So water is going to leave the cell and your cells will shrink. They will uh, shrivel. Um, and water will continue to leave the cell until the concentration of salt inside the cell is the same as outside the cell. So until you're at equilibrium, water will leave the cell at a faster rate than it goes in. I do want to note that water is also going into the cell at the same time. It's just leaving way faster than it is going in. So overall, you're going to shrink. All right, B, same idea. I have 150 millimolar salt inside the cell, 500 outside. So salt will go inside the cell until the two concentrations, you know, inside the cell and outside the cell are the same. So we're always trying to go towards equilibrium in chemistry um, and in biology as well. So if you're out of equilibrium, naturally you're gonna to wanna to go back to equilibrium. So that's how you can think of the salt and the water, right? I want these two salt concentrations to be the same, depending if I can move water or if I can move salt, how are they gonna move? And so um, that is your answer for that. All right. And that ends this PowerPoint, and I will move on to the next one. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to um, uh, chat those at me. So let me get up my other PowerPoint, the 28th, where we will go over acids and bases. This is basically a giant Gen Chem 2 review. All right, so Friday, August 28th. Now we're gonna be dealing with acids and bases a lot. In fact, all your proteins are made out of things that are acids and bases. So water goes inside the cell for B. Yes, uh, water will, no, water is not moving in B, sorry. B is ions only. Uh, so ions will go into the cell. We did not consider the water for B. Uh, if water could move for B, it would go outside the cell too but we were just talking about ions. Yeah, so your proteins 
are made off acids, amino acids. Your DNA is made off acids. Uh, those nucleotides, the phosphates on to, uh, connected to them are acids. Um, and so we need to know how acids and bases work to understand how life works. So your general descriptions, acid is something that donates a proton. You decrease pH. The more acidic you are, the lower the pH. A base will accept a proton. The more basic you are, the higher your pH. And when an acid um, interacts, it will form a base, or sorry, it's conjugate base. So here on, on my example, I have just an acid HA with a base H2O. The acid that is made is called the conjugate acid, and the base that is made is called the conjugate base. The acid and conjugate base are called conjugate pairs. Conjugate pairs. Because the only difference between them is just a proton. So HA and A minus are conjugate pairs. The same thing for the base in the, in the conjugate acid, right? So H2O and H3O plus are conjugate pairs of each other. The only difference is one proton. So that's the only difference between a conjugate pair, right? Acid becomes a conjugate base. A base becomes a conjugate acid in an acid-base reaction. Now, just so we understand that idea, um, I have some images here. And so I want you to see if you can recognize if, I, if A and B are acids, what would the conjugate base look like? If C and D are um, bases, what would the conjugate acids look like? So let's see if we have the concept of conjugate bases and conjugate acids down. So I'll give everybody um, you know, a minute or two See if you can come up where the with these new structures. And it will matter where you take the hydrogen from and where you put the hydrogen on. So just a, a reminder, an acid loses a hydrogen, a base will gain a hydrogen or a proton. So for A, if it's an acid, the conjugate base would just be NH2 instead of NH3. And bring a member, any hydrogen connected to a carbon is not acidic. Carbon will hardly ever lose a hydrogen unless um, through the use of an enzyme. NH3 plus though, that can be acidic. So that's where the hydrogen would come off and the base would just be NH2. In B, you're actually going to lose this hydrogen from this carboxylic acid. A carboxylic acid it is much more acidic than an NH3 group. And we'll look at this when we get into our amino acids. But the carboxylic acid is going to give up that hydrogen 
much faster than an NH3 plus. So if you actually draw, if you said the hydrogen is lost from the NH3 plus, um, you still made a base, you just made the incorrect base. All right, C, I have bases, what are my conjugate acids? Well, if I'm a base, I get a hydrogen, so it gets, a hydrogen gets attached to this carboxylic acid. Um, the same thing in D. Uh, you just find more or less the negative sign and you put a hydrogen, hydrogen, I can't talk anymore, hydrogen there. Now for C, it doesn't matter which oxygen you put it on since those oxygens are technically the same. Um, so I just put it on one. If you put it on the other, that's totally fine. But that is how conjugate pairs work. And I'll, I'll repeat this one more time. A conjugate pair is just different by one hydrogen. That's the only difference between a conjugate acid and base. How do I know that COOH was more acidic than the NH3? Is there a way to tell that from the structure or is that memorization? That is memorization slash um, knowledge gain from studying chemistry for the last like 15 years. Um, so a carboxylic acid is very acidic, COOH, because if, if we take a stroll back to organic chemistry, right? This functional group, um, you have a resonant structure between these two oxygens, right? These are equivalent structures. And what's going to happen is that those, that negative charge is going to bounce between those two oxygens incredibly fast, which will stabilize that negative charge. Now, nitrogen, um, nitrogen is actually okay being a positive charge. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. There's no, there we go. Um, it's okay being a positive charge. Nitrogen can handle that positive charge, just based where it is on its um, periodic table. Um, if you lost a hydrogen, it would get a lone pair of electrons. And nitrogen can still handle that. It just doesn't want to be like that. Nitrogen really doesn't want lone pair of electrons hanging around itself. It'd rather just be positive charge. So that's the, the long answer, well, the short answer is chemical intuition from dealing with these functional groups a lot. And basically anytime you see a COO minus or COOH, that thing will always lose the hydrogen. It is just incredibly acidic. Carboxylic acids are very acidic. We'll, we'll actually learn numbers with that. Um, yeah, so I have a question. Sorry, one sec. Okay, so I, do, do, do. All right, so Kate, you have a question, I think. Yes. Yeah, what's up? So for organic chemistry, they kind of drilled into my brain to view mechanisms on the Lewis acid base side as far as like electron donor and acceptor. Uh -huh. But as I'm reading through, it looks like we're going to be mainly focusing back in the uh, Bronsted-Lowry like scope. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. That's generally how I think about stuff. Um, where you either donate a hydrogen or take a hydrogen rather like than donating electrons or accepting electrons. Um, if, if you were drilled in a different way in organic chemistry, um, you should still be able to follow those rules and um, it should, I believe it, it should still just work out um, if, you're, if you're doing that as well. But moving forward, I will generally, when we talk about acids and bases, I'm generally gonna talk about protons. And then when we get into mechanisms, 
then we'll start doing some more electron donor acceptor type of stuff. But that, okay. that's, that's just the way I, I was taught and that's the way I kind of have it memorized myself. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I'm trying to get my mind in the right setting. Yep, yep, yep. But yeah, okay. it, it's, it's, it's the same idea really. It's just two different ways to think about it. I think. Yep. Okay, have some questions. On C, doesn't matter which oxygen the hydrogen goes. Nope. C, you can put it on either oxygen because those oxygens are equivalent um, resonance structure. Basically, just the same thing I went in the corner right there. Um, I just put it on the hydrogen that was, or the oxygen that was closest to my pen. It doesn't matter. All right. Let's go to following on. Why are we talking about all this? Well, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, oxygen is chosen and not NH2 because oxygen is more accepting on carbon. Um, oxygen is more electronegative, so it wants electrons more than nitrogen. So it's gonna lose its hydrogen uh, faster. It's more willing to donate if you want to talk about electrons, it's more willing to take the electrons from hydrogen, donate that proton, and oxygen will have those electrons around it. And so oxygen is way more electronegative than nitrogen. That's why oxygen is much more likely to lose its proton than nitrogen is. So that, that's the uh, um, electron um, um, explanation of what's going on there. All right. So... One more thing I want to talk about is um, acid, bases, and pH. So water will do what's called auto-ionize, and that water will break down into, um, well, I have H plus and OH minus, and then I have this note. So I'll just say this here. Anytime you see H plus moving forward, that's really... H3O plus. Like in water, you don't just have random protons flying around. They're going to form H3O plus, hydronium. But chemists are lazy. It's way easier, way faster to write H plus than H3O plus over and over and over again. So you're going to see H plus be shorthanded all over the time, all over the place. It's really H3O plus. All right. So just to clear that up. So water breaks down into hydronium and OH minus. Now there is um, an interesting phenomenon that happens, is that the concentration of H plus and OH minus, when multiplied together, they will always, always equal this constant called Kw, the ionization constant of water. Now at 25C, this constant is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. If hydrogen, if hydronium and OH minus are the same concentration, so if these are the same numbers, that means you can divide your Kw by two. If you divide your Kw by two, you will find H plus equals um, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. And that is why we say pH is 7. Um, basically, neutral pH is only 7 at room temperature. If you're at any other temperature, pH is not, uh, neutral is not 7. It's slightly off. Um, we're not going to worry about that. That's just a fun fact. If water's like 80 degrees centigrade, neutral is not seven anymore. It's like, I don't know, 7.08 or something like that. Uh, person just sent me the private message. Sure. Um, rather than me typing that out. Yep. Um, okay. So, for Kw, when we're looking at the amount of H plus and OH minus, if H plus is equal to our OH minus concentration, then it's neutral. If H plus is greater than OH minus, acidic, H plus less than OH minus, that's basic. Now, when we talk about pH, anytime you see a lowercase p in this class or in chemistry, that means minus log, negative log, negative log. 
So when you take the H plus concentration, you take the minus log of that. If you're neutral, your pH will be seven. If you're acidic, the number will be less than seven. If you're basic, it will be above seven. All right, so that's the pH scale. Just again, a review from general chemistry, KW. So let's work a little bit with acids and bases because anyone who joins the lab or wants to work in a lab, one of the tasks you're gonna do is make solutions. So I need to make sure you know how to make solutions. So I'll do uh, 2A and then um, I'll let you take some time to do 2B. All right, so I have, let me get my pen for 2A. I have a solution that is 200 milliliters of water. To that solution, I add 50 milliliters of one millimolar HCl. All right, so that's going in there. And that is a strong acid. And if this was an in-person class, I would say, what's a strong acid? And then everybody for sure would shout back, ionizes completely. So strong acid means um, breaks down 100%. All the hydrogen, all the hydrogen is released into the water. So in this class, we probably won't deal with weak acid chemistry all that much. We're going to deal with strong acids just to make it simple on you. So I want to know, I take 50 milliliters of this acid, put it into 200 milliliters, and what is my pH? All right. There's a couple ways to do this. Um, one that's really long and one that's super short. So I'm gonna tell you how to do the sh super short method. This is a dilution problem. So I'm just gonna write A down here. This is a dilution problem. We can use the dilution equation to solve it. M1B1 equals M2B2. One of the most useful equations in chemistry. So molarity of solution one, volume of solution one is equal to molarity of solution two, volume of solution two. All right, I'm gonna call my 50 milliliter solution, uh, solution one, all right? So the molarity of solution one is one millimolar. The volume is 50 milliliters. The molarity of solution two, I don't know. That is what we're trying to figure out. And now the volume of solution two. The volume of solution two is not 200. If you look back, remember the problem is I took 50 milliliters and put it into 200 milliliters. So the volume of my new solution is actually 250 milliliters. All right, so that's, that's the tricky part of this question. You have to realize you're mixing solutions. And so you get a new volume that is 200 plus 50. So when you do this, you can solve for M2. And so M2 is just 50 divided by 250. One sec. Just want to double check that I did my calculation right. Okay, so it is 50 divided by 250. Yep, so my molarity is 0.2 millimolar. All right, that's my new molarity. Now I want to get pH. pH is minus log. H plus concentration. So M2, that's actually H plus concentration. However, it's not quite. Another throwback from Gen Chem. Whenever you see a concentration in brackets, that is always 100% of the time molarity, big M. Molarity is moles divided by liters. Here, and point two, that's millimolar. So I need to convert from millimolar 
to molar. And that conversion is milli, if you remember from, again, Gen Chem. There are 1,000 millimolars in one molar. So all I do is I take my 0.2, divide by 1,000. So 0.2 millimolar, there are 1,000 millimolar in one molar. 0.2 divided by 1,000 is 0.2 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay. Then in your calculator, you type in minus, minus sign log, 0.2 times 10 to the minus 3. pH is 3.7. All right, so that was A with all my scribbles on the page. See if you can figure out B, where I want a solution that's 50 milliliters at a pH of 2.10. How much 10 millimolar of HCl do I need? How do I know that 0.2 millimolar was hydrogen and not OH? Because I'm dealing with HCl, I'm adding HCl to my solution. So HCl will always donate a hydrogen. Acid donates a hydrogen. If it was NaOH, if I said one molar millimolar of NaOH, that is a base, that's a strong base. And a base would donate an OH. And so then I would calculate my OH concentration. So basically, if I say in the problem it's an acid, you are calculating H plus concentration. If I say it's a base, you're calculating OH concentration. And you can work from there. And if you want to write down these notes, I'll give you like an, another minute because I need to uh, clear that screen because I took up way too much space. And B is more or less backwards from A. B, you're more or less doing the reverse than what we did in A. So if you're completely lost, Look how I finished A and try to work backwards from that. All right, so I'm gonna clear this. All right, B, I want a solution that has 50 molars at pH 2.10. How much 10 millimolar HCl do I need for this? Okay, so I know my pH is equal to 2.10. Remember, I said pH means minus log of H plus equals 2.10. So I want to know what is the concentration of H plus that I need? Because I'm saying I have 10 millimolar of HCl, right? So if I go to my pitcher, my final volume is 50 milliliter. I'm going to create this by taking 10 millimolar 
HCl plus water, I just don't know what concentrations I need to make that. So that's why they're X and Y. So I'm gonna start by asking, okay, how much H plus do I need to, need to get? So minus log H plus equals 2.10. Now, the first thing we do is we get the negative sign and we move it to the other side of the equation because I want to get my H plus along, alone. So log of H plus equals negative 2.10. Now I have log. Log is like ln. If there's a variable that you're trying to do the log of, you cannot touch that variable until you get rid of a log. The way you get rid of a log is that you take each side to the power of 10. So 10 to the power of a log, so 10, if I try to raise log to the power of 10, they cancel each other out. So H plus equals 10 to the power of negative 2.10, right? And so the amount of hydrogen, hydronium, I want, my concentration that I want is 0 0.007943 moles per liter. Again, bracket equals big M equals moles per liter molarity. All right, now I know how much hydrogen I wanna put in. I can do my dilution equation. M1B1 equals M2B2. All right, so let's just say that M1, our solution one is my acid. Um, solution two is the final solution I'm making. It doesn't matter which one you call one and two, it'll work out the same. All right, so my molarity of solution one is 10 millimolar. There's a problem though. I have one solution that's big M and another solution that's little m, big M. You cannot do the dilution equation if your units are different. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert um, little m millimolar to big M. So 10 millimolar. For every 1,000 millimolar, there is one molar. So that's equals 10 to the minus three molar. You just divide by a thousand to get into molar. All right, so M1 is 10 times 10 to the minus three. V1, V1 is how much of this acid do I add? I have no idea. That's the question that I'm asking. So that's V1. M2, so for my final solution, what's my concentration? That's why I solved for this H plus. 0 0.007943. What's my final volume? Well, it gives it to you in the equation. It's 50 milliliters. So you take your right side, multiply it together, divided by 10 times 10 to the minus uh, three, and you should get that this is the volume of acid you need to add is 39.71 uh, milliliters of acid. And so just to finish off this problem, it doesn't ask you this, that's actually your final answer. But if you're in a lab setting, what you would do is you would take this 39.71 and you would add that to water until you get to 50. So that would be 10.29 milliliters of water in total you'd get a solution that's 50 milliliters that would be at the molarity of, um, that we calculated, which would be at a pH of 2.10. So in a lab setting, that's how you make a solution with different pHs. And that is all the time we have for today. I thought we would get caught up, but we will, we will get caught up um, soon. Um, we're just going over some more acid and base stuff, a lot of calculations. Once we get out of the calculations, um, I'll be able to go a little quicker. I just want to make sure we all have these calculations down. 
Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about the calculations, uh, feel free to uh, send me an email or rewatch these videos. Just as a reminder, um, homework will be on Wiley Plus. So I'll put up the third assignment and it'll probably be up by like four o'clock. You have until Sunday to do all three of those assignments. Otherwise, um, like I said, if you have anything, please let me know. But have a good weekend and I'll see you all on Monday. Have a good one.